watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV from Toronto, Ontario. I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Coming up, an interview with Dr. Barbara Perry, who is an expert on far-right groups in Canada. But first, some news headlines. Canada hopes to replace Russia as Europe's natural gas provider. Ontario Premier meets Muslim organizations and leaders. First Muslim shelter for women and children to open in Winnipeg. And far-right Islamophobic Vox party to govern for the first time in Spain. And now, the details. Federal Minister of Natural Resources Jonathan Wilkinson announced that the government is considering providing natural gas to Europe. Wilkinson says Russia's invasion of Ukraine exposed Europe's reliance on Russian energy. European countries are struggling to ban Russian gas as it accounts for nearly 40% of their usage. Canada's major liquefied natural gas project, or LNG, will launch in 2025. Wilkinson says that LNG is low emission and providing natural gas to Europe will not disturb Canada's climate plans. Dozens of Muslim groups attended Associate Minister of Digital Government MPP Khalid Rashid's election fundraiser yesterday. Muslim leaders who spoke expressed gratitude to Ontario Premier Doug Ford for his support to the Muslim community. Ford emphasised Muslim contributions to the province and Canada. Vice President of Sound Vision Foundation Taha Hayur, and colleagues from Muslim Network TV and Canadian Muslim News attended the event, being one of the first North American Muslim news media outlets. The first Muslim shelter for women and children in Winnipeg, Manitoba, is underway as Sakina Homes and the Islamic Social Services Association team up to address reports of violence. The space will offer women and children a safe haven to get back on their feet as they recover from traumatic and abusive circumstances. The need for a Muslim shelter arose after women reported having their headscarves pulled off or Islamophobic remarks directed to them at mainstream places. Zina Chowdhury, CEO of Sakina Homes, told local media sources that a rise in calls for help has come from Muslim women in Manitoba in the past two years. A 2019 Statistics Canada report found that Manitoba had the highest rates of police-reported family violence per province. Spain's far-right Vox Party will form a coalition government in the region of Castile and Lyon. Their first win comes after the Conservative Popular Party failed to win a majority in regional elections that it triggered in hopes of governing alone. The Vox Party became notorious for its anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant sentiment, as well as its socially conservative positions on women, according to media sources. Last week, Vox's national leader, Santiago Abascal, argued in Parliament that Ukrainian refugees should be accepted into Spain, but called Muslim migrants crossing into the country from Africa invaders. Over 40,000 Muslims live in the region of Castile and Lyon. And that's it for the news. The truck convoy has raised attention to far-right extremism in Canada. To talk to us, we have an expert, Dr. Barbara Perry from Ontario Tech University. Welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Good to see you again, Kathy. Good to see you. Now, when I first met you, you were studying anti you were studying anti-Muslim hate crimes. And then you switched to looking at far-right extremism in Canada. And I feel that you switched like way before anyone was even thinking about this topic. Now it's front and center. What was it that you saw back then that made you want to switch? Well, I'm, my work has been in the field of hate studies quite broadly, not just anti-Muslim violence. Uh, and so even years ago when I was still working in the U.S. and I was looking at violence against uh, indigenous communities in the United States, because I was in Arizona, I was also paying attention to the far right movement there. Uh, so it was always uh, sort of on my radar. Um, but even in the context of the work that I was doing on Islamophobic violence, uh, 
Uh, of course, you know, at the fringes, we were already starting to see anti-Muslim groups emerging uh, and, you know, online communities that were targeting Muslims with their, their narratives, as long as, as well as people on the streets who were uh, targeting Muslims much more directly and, and physically. So it was a sort of a, a logical extension and something that was brought to the fore through the work on anti-Muslim violence. Mm. And for those who might not be familiar with these terms, we use the words left, right, far right. Can you just give us a brief 101? What's the difference between left, right? And is there a difference sort of between right and far right? Yeah, really good question and, and uh, hard to do in, in a few minutes. The Cole, Cole's note version is it, it's sort of a political spectrum. And, and we tend to think, I guess, of, um, you know, those on the left as being um, progressive in values, you know, social justice oriented, whereas those on the right tend to be much more conservative uh, and uh, reactionary. So rather than progressing, you know, rights and inclusion for all, uh, they are more interested in, in rolling back the protections for uh, diverse communities. And sort of the further uh, to the right you go on that spectrum, uh, the more, uh, I guess, aggressive that response is in terms of, you know, eliminating the rights for particular individuals at the furthest extremes when we're talking about right wing extremism. Uh, it's actually, you know, some way of eliminating or continuing to oppress and silence uh, those targeted groups or those troublesome groups as they may define them. Um, so on the extremes, it, it can involve calls for violence, the violent expulsion of uh, target communities, racialized communities, um, you know, queer communities, um, religious uh, faith-based communities. Has far-right extremism always existed in Canada the way we see it today? Well, we're grounded in, uh, you know, white settler colonialism, which is, uh, you know, itself intimately tied with white supremacy. So those kinds of ideals uh, and that notion of, you know, white privilege and, uh, you know, the... the um, uh, white supremacy, uh, you know, that's that's part of our history. In terms of the organized right, um, <clears throat> we've absolutely seen that uh, since the, the 1920s with, you know, the KKK uh, being so active in uh, Western Canada, but also, uh, you know, parts of Central Canada as well. Uh, and, and then it's cyclical. I mean, there are times when it lies dormant. Um, so there was a long period, uh, you know, post-war, post-Second World War, when we were still cognizant of the atrocities of the uh, the Holocaust, that uh, organized far-right groups were mm, latent, at least, uh, bubbling below the surface. Mm. Uh, so we started to see again during the civil rights movement, the reemergence of white supremacist groups. Uh, but in the Canadian context, I, I think the last time we really saw a, a large increase was in, there a lot of activity was in the 90s. Um, mm short-lived couple of years and then of course the past five or six years have just been um you know out of control in the canadian context unlike anything we've seen historically and the conservative party though which i believe is called a right party not far right has uh, done some you know recruiting with minorities they have minority politicians now in in the party and, and running and uh holding office it it, it is that a morphing or a change? Is there a more distinct barrier now between like what we call right and far right? The, I think the Conservative Party right now at the federal level um, specifically is in, in crisis. I think they're, they're trying to walk a very fine line because they do have some who have been, uh, you know, who have explicitly supported and, uh, you know, condoned the the far right movements that were associated with the convoy and yet we have others within the party who are trying to distance uh the party from that so i think that you know this this leadership campaign coming up will be really for the life and soul of the party to determine which direction they're going to go are they going to maintain that historical centrist position or are they going to move uh slightly uh, well maybe even further uh, to the right, especially around, you know, social, uh, social issues, uh, social values, the, the kinds of conversations that would, uh, you know, be part of the far right conversation as well. I've used your research in the past, actually, quite often. Uh, and one of the findings that I often say, is this one where you did a study, uh, a counting study. So between 1980 and 2017, 
you counted 120 right-wing extremist acts in Canada, I think it was Canada, versus seven violent acts committed by uh, extremist Muslims. And yet in 2011, Stephen Harper, when he was prime minister, said Islamicism was the greatest threat to Canada. Do you think he might be changing his mind now with the Freedom Convoy? Well, not just the Freedom Convoy, but what we've seen for the past five or six years, a real dramatic increase. So there have been qualitative and quantitative shifts in the far right. So that same study where we identified those incidents, we also identified uh, around 100 active uh, far right groups in the Canadian context, probably a conservative estimate even then. But in our updated study that we're just concluding now over the last couple of years, we've been able to identify over 300 uh, active groups. So uh, it's very hard, I think, to deny the presence of the far right uh, and the uh, the activism of the far right. You know, in, the, in 2016, 2017, of course, we saw a lot of rallies uh, on the ground, uh, anti-Muslim rallies, anti-immigration, uh, rallies. Uh, again, under COVID, you know, we've seen the far right very active uh, online and, and offline in terms of the anti-lockdown protests, uh, the anti-mandate protests, and they were very much front and center uh, in the convoys as well. So uh, it would be, it would be, I think, disingenuous uh, and willful blindness to deny the risk associated with the far right now. There were uh, swastikas on display in the truck convoy, and I remember knowing that an NDP uh, MP has put forward a private member's bill. I, I, I couldn't find out what happened to it, but proposing the ban of the sale of such uh, hateful symbols. Do you think that's the right way for the government to, to go? Well, there are a whole array of symbols there, and I think that's one of the, the challenges. I mean, some of them have, uh, you know, notorious uh, histories that, uh, that link them uh, to racism, to hatred, to violence against uh, particular communities. Um, so I think that, I, I think it's an interesting um, approach. Now, the, the challenge, the difficulty with any of that sort of thing, and even with that, the designation of terrorist entities, um, one of the drawbacks, uh, the downside is that it actually um, can backfire and it exacerbates the tensions. It actually feeds into that victim mentality uh, mm. or that, uh, you know, that perception and that, that grievance that, you know, it's those on the far right who are being silenced, that their views are, uh, you know, are being quashed, that they're the oppressed uh, community. Mm. So, uh, excuse me, it can enhance their own sense of, uh, of entitlement uh, and I think can bring others to the fold as well. Nonetheless, we absolutely have to find ways to restrict the, uh, the use and the ex um, exploitation of those sorts of symbols. Uh, and, and at the very least, uh, educate communities so that they understand what what the intention is, what the message is associated with them. Uh, because and what would you recommend? Is, uh, what would you recommend? We're, we're almost out of time, but what would you recommend as, as one useful thing the government could do to protect those of us who now are feeling quite scared from the far right? Yeah, um, I think it, one thing is let's just enforce the legislation that we have. I mean, we have pretty strong legislation around um, uh, hate propaganda in particular, incitement to genocide, incitement to, uh, to hatred. Uh, and that legislation is very rarely used. It's a very high standard, a very high bar uh, for it to gain approval from the AG's office. So I think that that is really where we need to start, as well as then supporting the work of civil society organizations uh, who at the local level recognize the threats, understand the threats, and are probably a better position to intervene than, uh, than as the federal government. And we're out of time, but thank you very much for shedding light on this topic for us. Thank you, Kathy. You've been watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Share, like and subscribe. Stay safe and God bless.